right. So I was just saying to someone yesterday about how much I love this program and about how awesome it is and how wonderfully um, adaptive it's been to everything that I need to do, right? And then, of course, this morning I ran straight into a technical wall um, where my guest was forced to completely restart her computer. It's okay. Wusa, we're here. Thank you for tuning in to the Trish.0 show. And this is a show where we ask event professionals all sorts of questions about all things events. And if you saw in the promo, today's guest is Jamie Lee Quickert. She is uh, just this wonderfully well-rounded pro. Um, but why am I talking about her? Let's go ahead and get her on and have her tell her story. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, I am just glad that we're here. I'm glad that we're on. I can hear you. You can hear me. It's a miracle. Cheers. Cheers. I wish this was full of vodka. <laughs> that would make for a really interesting interview um for sure uh, you know for that but uh, but jamie just you know for those people who do not know you um in a nutshell um just let everybody know who you are and what you do i am jamie lee quickert i am the director of catering and events at the detroit institute of arts i am president of the detroit chapter of nace and i speak a lot around the country at cater source wedding mba ilea um nace etc in a yeah, nutshell I Right, just just those things, just just you know, just a, like small. Things. Forty under uh, forty winner. I was real proud of that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, well deserved for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, it's all um, like it's it's all the things, right? And I think that when you're passionate about the industry, you're you're just more prone to be like all about the industry. And I think I think that's kind of the, the dividing line from what I've seen, right? Um, you know, and certainly you've had such a long career um you know how you know what was it about catering specifically um that really made you kind of you know look at that and say yes that that is going to be my track that's where i'm going to go so um i i had done a ton of volunteer work doing events and when i first got into the hospitality industry like really into it i was in corporate america so i worked for deloitte and touche and then i worked for general mills um but there was a venue that I was in love with in Minneapolis, Minnesota, called the Varsity Theater in Loring Prastabar. And I saw that they had a sales manager um, director position. And I wasn't really qualified because I had done a lot of hospitality, but I hadn't done any sales. But I loved this venue so much. And I wrote the world's most ridiculous cover letter and sent in my resume and it said, you are cordially invited to the interview of a lifetime. Like with who? Uh, Jamie Quicker. Why? Because the moment Jamie walked into the varsity, she fell in love with, you know, it was ridiculous. But the <laughs> owner really liked it. And he um, called me in for an interview and I came in for an interview and he liked me. And then he called me back for a second interview and it was like a big group interview. And he said, during like 10 people, and he said, we've had hundreds of applicants and you know, we've narrowed it down to our top three choices, but you are probably one of the least qualified out of all hun like hundreds of applicants. Uh, you've never done any sales. What makes you think you can do this job? And I said, well, I'm your least qualified applicant, but I'm the one sitting here. So clearly I can sell something. Um, and he, <laughs> and he was like, you're right. And they gave me the job, but I think I, so that's when I first like became a part of the whole process of actually like walking people through events and kind of um, helping them vision and dream what an event was going to look like. And then, you know, the logistics of making it happen and working with creative partners. And I fell in love with it. I thought it was magical. I thought there was no place I would rather be. Um, and I thought I was super lucky. And then from there, you know, the more I get involved, I'm such a huge, fan and advocate for other people in the industry because the things that they're doing are crazy. And I tell people all the time, normally, <laughs> and the pandemic is not happening, we are in, in this amazing industry where we create beauty and magic and we celebrate love and what's not to like about all that. A hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent with you there. And it's, it's that level of passion, which is what I think, you know, initially even attracts someone who might not have necessarily been working 
um, directly in the event space. Right. Um, to you know, to to further you know further their career within the events industry, um, and and I think that sometimes you know that can it can either be very energizing to someone or a little bit off putting, um, depending on which way you know which way you're kind of you know inclined to to view. It. It's I think that the problem is that people who are not in this industry see the magic and they see the beauty, but what they don't see is the amount of people that it takes to make something look effortless and flawless and how long it takes to set something up and how you know and how we're like walking around and making sure the tablecloths are all perfectly right and the seams are lined up like it's a lot of work and a lot of hours um half the people in our industry right now are literally working for free because we can't just like not have our clients or we have to keep working on events that are happening and so i think that's I think people sometimes get into it because they seem passionate, but they don't stay in it because it takes a lot of work. And that's what separates people who do this for a career versus people who do this for a hobby. That's an amazing way to, I think that's an amazing way to put it. Um, because I think that, uh, you know, there's certainly, there's always been a, a certain level of conversation around, you know, people who are, you know, who I would consider pros and consider themselves professionals, people who do this full time um, and people who are sort of like in it, you know, for the long haul. And, and, you know, and the others who are hobbyists, um, right. and not that we don't necessarily need hobbyists in this industry. Um, I think that there can be value um, in what they in what they do, they can certainly fill in a lot of the gaps when we're getting into like a busy time frame, right? Like sometimes mm -hmm. you just need that extra labor. Um, Except, yeah, here's the problem to interrupt you. No, 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 go ahead. I absolutely agree with that. But what I think we as wedding industry people and even people who are dabbling in it need to understand is that it is a marketable skill and and it is there's a value associated with it. And what happens is that people come in and they're the hobbyist or they're just doing it for free or just doing it for fun. And then they undercut all these other people where someone will say like, oh, I'll go to the farmer's market and I'll get some flowers and I'll create your flower arrangement and I'll do it for $10 per arrangement. Now, suddenly the florist who's charging $200 for the same arrangement looks exorbitant, but that's what we do for a living. Like, you know, I think it was, was it Picasso who drew the little stick figure? And, and the guy said, I'm not paying for that. It took five minutes. And he said that was the past like 50 years of training or something like that. Like, yeah, you're not paying you know, me for five minutes. You're paying me for sure. five but that's also, I think, our responsibility as people who are actually event professionals, when we yeah. see people who are hobbyists and dabbling to say, this is what this skill is worth. This is what this is what you should be charging and you could be charging and you deserve to be paid for your time, just like we deserve to be paid for ours. I think that I think that's an incredibly important point, especially, you know, if you're out there and you're listening to this program and, you know, and you, you know, you know who you are, you're the hobbyist again, no shade. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a hobbyist, but if you're if you're getting pushback from event pros, if you're getting the feeling that sometimes it's a little clickish, sometimes it's a little, um, you know, people may not necessarily be all that open to you being in the industry. Uh, Jamie, you're 100 percent right. Th that is the reason why I have no problem with like a part time DJ as long as my part time G DJ is, you know, charging for the same quality of work. Um, at right. the same rate as a full-time DJ. DJ. Um, florist, same thing. Uh, you're you're 100 right. Like you know, there are plenty of girls that you know they pop up in the garage door and they do have a few bouquets, um, and that's not a problem. But when you're when you're undercutting, you know, so many other people, uh, you, you know, it, undercutting. I mean, you you may think that you're earning a you know um, a, you know a really great you know deal. Like like oh, people shouldn't be charging this much, or you know, I'm I'm earning business. Well, no, you're not. Because what you're not, because I guarantee anyone who has ever undercut another vendor did not quali did not evaluate how much time right. it took them to put that to put that together. A hundred percent. Value that. They just said, oh, well, you know, I can go down to the wholesale flower market and I can buy these roses for 50 bucks. Um, yeah, it might take me, you know, and I mean, 
you know, I'll, I'll, I suppose and then you have to transport, transport like there's yeah, so many the steps involved that yeah. people don't always realize. But the more important thing is it just drives down the value of your market as a whole. Each of us, whatever city we're in, we have a baseline. That's the value baseline for venue baseline for event planner baseline for florist. And the more people undercut you, the more it drives down that whole market and that whole baseline. And then suddenly you have to undercut even lower and then you're not even making a par profit. There's no ROI on that because you have to figure out what your time is worth. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. I could talk well, all day on this subject. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a hot topic, people. It's a hot topic. Um, and I under, I also understand that, that a lot of the reason people undercut is because maybe they just don't know, you know, why people charge, you know, why does a florist charge $500 for a centerpiece that you don't think should be more than $200? Right. Um, so I so in that particular case, if you know that you're someone that undercuts or that you under underprice, I would heavily encourage you to make you know to form relationships, make friends in this industry. We mm -hmm. will advise you um, that yeah, you know what when you're pricing something out, uh, included in all the you know it's not just the flowers you're paying for, it's the cooler, it's the the price of gas, it's the labor of the person that's driving that bouquet. All of that, all of that's not free. Someone's right. getting paid somewhere, so you need to recoup those costs in some way. But um, again, we we could be talking about that nonsense. <laughs> like I, like at the end of the day, sometimes it's just like, like, are you kidding me? Just like learn your value and stop with the nonsense. Just well, and it's just across the board in service industries. People are constantly yeah. asking my hair, my like hairdresser friends to cut their hair for free or accountants to do your text. Like we just have to understand we all have a value, even if we're in the service industry. And there's a lot of times where my friends or family will say, um, they'll say, um, you know, like, oh, I really want your help with my wedding. I'll pay you. And I'm always like, girl, you can't afford me, but I will happily gift this to you because I'm not going to insult myself or you by saying like, sure, I'll do it for $50. Like, <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, yeah. Same thing. Like I, I've had people approach me and I'm like, you know what? I, you know, I will gift this to you. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, you know what then? you know we'll just whatever whatever you feel comfortable paying me mm -hmm. um and just and just to show you know on my end it, you just know that it's probably what i'm going to pass on pass along to the assistants like right. just uh, just cover my costs for whatever you know, a, you know day of help that we need right um, and, and we're probably good um mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's all you know it, it all kind of drives home this whole um point of why you know why I wanted you on and specifically actually why why I've always really loved your personality um, because you genuinely uh, at least from my perception um, you're you're not only someone who is like um, yes you know female empowerment and girls in the workforce and all about the industry and let's all band together um, you're genuinely about that you're not someone yes. who says it and it's lip service because we know there are plenty of people out there who, you know, for whom it's lip service and you don't get to, you know, you don't get to know that until it's kind of too late. Right. Um, but I, I, you're the real deal. And I want to thank you. I try to be the real deal. I just, I think that there, you know, this world is already hard and, and in our industry, it's hard, but for women, it's especially hard. I think, um, I think for black women, it's even more difficult. Um, and so I just try to be an advocate for people who maybe have been told that the industry looks one way or should be one way to say, you can be fully you, whatever that is, and still be smart and powerful and successful. And, and, and you have a voice and you have a place here and you need to charge your worth. Uh, you know, I think the more people who who advocate that for each other, the stronger our, our business will be. And, you know, there's so many haters in this world. I think, I think it becomes apparent real fast who is loyal and who is genuine. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent on that. And, uh, you know, we, what, what some people might not know actually um, is that last year, you reached out to me, you reached out to a few other people and you invited us into this panel discussion that we, that was, you know, on a national stage, Nation Nate's experience conference. And we talked about like women in the industry and the challenges that we faced. Um, and that was really a prevalent theme 
was, you know, no one likes a backstabber. Not like, you know, and backstabbers exist on, you know, male, female, you know, gay, straight, right. you know, they exist in, in, in all arenas and in all realms, you know, no matter what industry you're in. Um, and, and yet that still prevails. No one likes that person. And yet that person still prevails. Um, and I and I don't necessarily understand it. But, uh, you know, the, the one takeaway that I had from being on the panel with you and with the others, and certainly from the audience feedback, is that we're not going to tolerate that mess anymore. You know, like, I really loved, I think it was, yeah. I can't remember who it was, but somebody on that panel said that they wanted to be a woman that other people would not feel comfortable talking to or gossiping to. Like if, if you had a problem, I don't want to be the person that you feel comfortable coming to me and talking shit about someone because I'll be the first one to say, did you talk to that person? And I thought like, that's a really powerful stance to just like say, I don't want to be a part of that, like catty backstabbing. And and am I allowed to say a bad word? Uh, you're yeah. Feel free. Okay. <laughs> like I would a thousand times rather be a bitch to someone's face than to be catty behind their back. And and Lord knows I can be catty, but I can try to be super genuine in how I feel to them. And if I have a problem with and there's been times where I've had pe problems with people in the industry, and I just say it like I don't like that you did this, or I I don't appreciate that thing. And and sometimes it's hard, and sometimes it's a terrible conversation. But usually we come out on the other end stronger. I think the problem is that so many of us are afraid to just have a conversation. Well, and I think that's it, it, that's amazing. Um, it, it is incredibly challenging, especially for people who are just either non-confrontational -confronta or don't know how to manage that. Um, mm -hmm. But that's why I'm the director of catering for the, you know, for the DIA. You know, that's how that's how you got to that job. Um, you know, so so talk to me about sort of like, you know, did you work for the DIA beforehand or like what was the what was the progress to that position? No, I worked for a company called um, Lancer Hospitality, Lancer Catering, which I loved. I loved it so much. Um, I grew so incredibly much. Um, Glenn Barron is the owner and he really mentored me and took me under his wing. And I started there as um, the the assistant director of catering and then i um like within a month became the director of catering sales and then i wanted to be the director of like i just my position kept evolving as i became better at things and i loved it but i traveled all of the time um i in 2017 i traveled 252 days out of the year and when I was not traveling, we had seven accounts in Minneapolis where I was stationed out. So I just ended up working so much. Um, and it was okay because I loved my job, but I had no work-life balance. Um, and then to get real, real, which I have in various forms, um, that at the end of the year, I had two miscarriages and um, I was on a business trip and I called my boss and I cried. And then I went to a meeting um, and then went to the hospital. And then also that at the end of that year, my dad had two life threatening surgeries. He ended up having like a, a heart surgery and I was on a business trip and I was like, do I need to come home or do I not? And is he dying? And, and at the end of that, I thought that doesn't make me a good businesswoman. That makes me an asshole. Like, I, I had my priorities all out of whack. And so um, there was a company, Culinaire, who had kind of been headhunting me because we were competitors when I was at Lancer. And they got the account at the DIA as a new account. And they asked me if I would come. And Detroit is my home. It's where my family is, my sisters and my um, nephews and nieces. And it's close to Ohio where my dad is. And so that's how I ended up there. And I, it's magical. I love it. I, you know, I work with Van Gogh and um, Wiley and and Andy Warhol and all these great pieces of art that I see every single day. So it's pretty fun. Yeah, I really enjoy that part of your feed, um, your social media feed, when you when you talk about the different pieces of art and everything like that. Because mm -hmm. I don't I don't think people know that that the DIA has such an amazing collection. I know most people don't know we're actually ranked in like the top five museums in the country. Um, wow. We have a super extensive. 
um, art collection. And that's one of my favorite parts of Detroit. So people have this preconceived notion of who Detroit was and is. And when Detroit declared bankruptcy, they were going to auction off a lot of the art because it was one of the assets that the city had. And the people of the city raised an exorbitant amount of um, money just to protect all of the art. And so like when I give tours to people, especially from out of town, that's what I always say is people have these this idea of what Detroit is, but this place shows you how much we love art and culture and history. Like we're the renaissance of, of great inventors. So I don't know, I like it. Yeah, I could Detroit's wax poetic city. about Detroit for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's it, it's a, it's certainly, it's a fantastic city. So, so definitely, you know, I mean, you know, people are on lockdown. They're gonna have, you know, time on their hands once, you know, post lockdown, get out to Detroit. Come to yeah, Detroit. Yeah, um, why not? Be my guest. I'll buy you a drink. There you, there you go. There mm -hmm. you go. Um, and certainly, you know, when we're talking about things that you're very passionate about, and you were talking about um, some really, you know, tough subjects, you you have pursued a public speaking career where that has become part of things you speak on. Those are those have been topics that you you know speak on. Um, did you, was that necess, was that something that you said, you know what, I have a story to tell and I, I want to share that with other people or was it an external push or like, it was like some, did someone approach you and say, you know what, Jamie, you have such an amazing, um, you know, uh, such amazing, uh, you know, educational value for people in this, you know, in this industry, in the world. I think it was probably a mix of the both. Um, okay. You know, I was speaking a lot and I do a lot of fun sales classes like 60 seconds to sell and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, what to do when your clients get crazy. Um, but I feel very passionate, especially in these one-on-one -on -one conversations about just like hearing people's story and being real. I think people don't really realize in our industry how much everything is curated. Like, you know, our our Instagram feeds, our Facebook feeds are the way we dress, the way we talk, everything is curated for the sale and to to create this magical world. And sometimes that doesn't leave a lot of room for us to be vulnerable and to be broken and to have painful experiences in our own lives. Um, and, and a lot of times we talk through things in such a past tense way of like, you know, years ago I struggled with this, but now I'm fine. And, and people don't have the freedom to be currently struggling. And so um, it just, it evolved as I talked and as people would come up to me and I would share little parts of my story and people would resonate, it would resonate with people more and more. And then what I realized is, it's one thing for me to teach a class where people leave and their sales double or they make more money. And it's another thing for me to teach a class and somebody to leave and feel empowered to ask ask for more money or change the trajectory of their career or say no to somebody they feel like is sexually harassing them or to um, set boundaries and take care of their family or to step away. Like things that, things that make a lasting impact, not just in people's professional life, but their personal life um, matter. And so I think sometimes even when we go to shows and conferences, as you know, it's so glitz and glamour and it's all about money and it's all about, you know, what's the next trend and what's the next big thing. And sometimes we forget that we're just fragile human beings behind all of that. You know, our clients forget that and we forget that. Well, and, you know, and, and really, at, at your core, what you're talking about about is the depth of human experience. Is that I, that you know? I'm sure you have encountered this before. I have encountered this multiple times as an event planner, where you know I will go up to someone and I will say, you know, I'm an event planner, and they'll be like, oh, you know, and, and immediately what they're thinking about is like glitter balls and cotton candy and fluffy things. Right. And I must be, and, and I must be this vapid little you know person who you know is I don't know on a bicycle all day I like I don't like I don't understand <laughs> you know, yeah, those flowers. bicycle riding events planners <laughs> yeah exactly like you know, just, flowers. right right just riding along the beach with a basket of flowers handing them to people la 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 um you know, like you know like you get this sort of response that it, that what we do is not serious um, right that it is not an industry that it does not have have the um depth which is really what kind of you know drew me to you know to cre even creating this program um was i felt like you know i think that people you know should get a little bit you know in depth um with the people behind what you know what what we do what and why we do it 
Mm -hmm. um, and certainly for, for yourself, um, having these different outlets like the public speaking, um, for those of you who don't know, um, and you know, if you're if you're on Instagram, you also have an Instagram feed, Jamie Lee Quicker, where you're you know now becoming like a fashion blogger because these are because you have layers. You have you're right. a, you're a person with interests, and and yes, you love catering, and yes, you love events, but that's not a hundred percent of who you are. There's I think that's what's been interesting for all of us in this industry as the like pandemic has happened, like dealing with coronavirus is I will speak for myself. I have spent 20 years building my career, building my image, curating myself around this thing that is events. And suddenly when when we're not sure what the events world is going to look like, when we're not sure how many people can gather. And that's the whole crux of what we do. I had this like deep identity crisis. I like literally cried to my husband. And I was like, I don't know how to do anything but this. Like I've spent way too long doing this. And it was scary to think that this whole thing may crumble. And, and, you know, with a little bit of distance, I don't exactly think that's what's happening. I think we're going to reinvent ourselves and it'll be good. But I think um, even for ourselves, sometimes we have to remember that we're layered and that there's more to us than parties or, you know, or, or our title. Yeah, 100%. You know, and definitely, you know, as as people are kind of walking themselves through, you know, the various stages of whatever they're kind of going through right now, um, just know that, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, you, it, you don't have to, I mean, you know, maybe you were, you know, all about the career and everything about that, you know, before, um, you know, but, but now's the time that if you, you know, if you ever wanted to be the, the plus, you know, like catering pro plus, right. Uh, you know, like, or as, you know, or as, you know, people have often referred to sometimes event planners, the multi hyphenate, like, you know, you do this I love that. and that hyphen this. Um, so, so to become the, the multi hyphenate, um, you know, it's certainly a, like a great way to go. Um, and but wait, I do have one thing to say, yeah, Trish. Oh, do it. Okay. Cause I actually say this to people sometimes I did this really fun, um, seminar class, um, and I would ask people to introduce themselves and that's, they would say, oh, my day job is this, but I also am a florist and I also am this. And I would just say to anyone who's looking to add those pluses or, or hyphens to make sure you understand, especially when you're introducing yourself, what the market is and what your brand is in that particular time, because you devalue yourself when you don't give yourself a niche. So if I am talking to other fashion people, then I am a fashion blogger. If I'm talking to people in the event industry, then I am and a director of catering, you know, you want to make sure that you stay in your niche um, as much as possible so that you can build your brand. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with you on that. I, I like I don't think it's appropriate at, you know, at, you know, at all times to let people know 100% of who you are. And, you know, just, you know, again, situationally, um, right. If you're, if you're networking for business, keep it about the business there's no need for someone to know that you also make you know crocheted puppy hats uh, even though i personally love the idea of them maybe you work that into the conversation maybe, right maybe you don't Later. maybe you don't lean in yeah right with with that it's like you know i'm a, i'm an venue owner and i make crocheted puppy hats um fantastic um but but what was it about um fashion like i love fashion so i get it a hundred percent i get where you're coming from with that um but but what was it about that for you where you were like you know what um yeah well like why can't i add this to what i do um i've always really loved fashion and for a long time, that this was one of those instances, like you said, is it internal or external? This probably is almost more external than internal. Like I've always personally really loved fashion, but a lot of people for a really long time have said, oh, you should like have a fashion Instagram or fashion blog or where did you get that thing? Um, and I also think for curvy ladies, um, I, I will not say what service it was, but I did one of those shopping services where they shop for you and like everything was like floral and super, like super big, but they also gave me the shirt and it had those like flip sequins on them, you know, like, like oh, kids wow. wear. I love the fabric. I love the fabric. I wouldn't really wear it, but I, yeah. But, but I think, but I think, you know, in general, I think that people don't understand that as a plus size woman, you can embrace your curves and that there's something really sexy about the woman woman's shape and that you 
you know, like on one hand, you can wear exactly what your skinny counterparts wear. And on the other hand, you want to wear things that highlight your figure and not hide it. And so you should just dress for your body. And that size doesn't matter. I mean, I have I have clothes that are size 14 and I have clothes that are size 20. And and what I care about is how they fit on my body. And so I just again, I think it's like this all encompassing of just wanting to be an advocate for people and who you are and what you are. And like wherever you are in life, you want to be the best, the baddest, the like most sexy, most brilliant, most successful version of you possible. And I want to be that for myself. And I want to inspire other people to do that. I want people to say I sparkle more because of you. <laughs> Well, and I think I think you're on the road to that. I think that there are you know plenty of people who've already been inspired by you, um, and certainly you know I, I think you'll continue to do that you know as, as time goes on, um, and and certainly I think what we're talking about you know in in all of this is kind of this general shift of what it means to be a, a woman creative or a woman in the workforce. Um, you know, years ago, I, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, years ago I did work for American Express and, you know, their meeting and planning services division. And my, my boss, um, you know, she was a woman, she was a woman of particular age. She, you know, she had this, and she came from a background that really dictated that a, a, women were playing in a man's world. So right. she behaved, you know, she approached business from a very masculine perspective. Um, and when I say masculine perspective, what I really mean is this very sort of like cut and dry, black and white. Um, you know, if I ask you to give up time with your family, you're going to do that, you know, because we, you know, if you're going to be considered a company woman. Um, and, uh, you know, it was difficult sometimes communicating with her because I felt like anyone my age, you know, at the time or younger, uh, really had that 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 just fundamental difference that that you know difference of, of thinking about how we should approach the workforce like why can't we marry all these things why can't we be a blend of, of all these things like you said like you know the thought of you dressing fabulously you know to work would have just not been you know a concept 20 years ago right and you know it's funny because there's different people have different feelings about like hashtag girl boss or boss babe or all of these things and i get it and and one of the main reasons is because that in real life is so much more true than like just some cliche saying on a coffee cup um like there's so much more to it than you have to earn that title um but i think that there's something really wonderful and powerful about saying like you can wear dresses and have red lips and or you could wear a power suit or you know because i think the flip side of it is maybe you are more masculine or maybe you are more feminine like whatever the fuck you want to be just be really good at that thing and just show up like fully show up um and so like for me personally i feel sexy and powerful in a dress or a pair of pants with a great pair of heels. I feel wonderful with red lips, but that's not everybody's jam. And I think right. we just need to like encourage people to find who they are. And, and just like in the past, people thought they had to be like over masculine to succeed. I worry sometimes that now there's this, this, flip of it where people think oh to succeed i have to like i don't want anyone to think they have to look exactly like me or talk like me or dress like me you just have to be you but be it yes. fearlessly that that was good and that's right that's it it's down <laughs> <laughs> right exactly um you know right, yeah that, that's amazing and and again it's all about it's about finding yourself Right. Um, and all of that uh, and not holding anyone else to those expectations. You know, and I think and I think that was more more to the to the problem of it is that 100 percent, you know, you know it, it's it's OK. It's OK to be, you know, if you're if like you're more masculine leaning or you're just, you know, you're not the girly girl and you like this, blah, blah, blah. Fantastic. Do you and do that 100 mm -hmm. um, percent. But what, it's when you impose that on on anyone else and you're like, no, oh, you know, uh, you know, we could talk about sort of like dot com and the boom of the, you know, the dot com, you know, businesses and startups, um, you know, as, as sort of how they relate to the events world. Um, because that it's been that sort of mentality where you just show up, you show right. up, you do the work, um, you do the work well, and that's what really counts. Um, well, and I think yeah. 
if I were mentoring somebody that that's what I, I would just say, you have to understand what you bring to the table. Like right. what are the five best things about you, be it physically, emotionally, mentally, like the five best things about you and then cultivate that and be fully those five best things. Like, and then that's what people will see and that's what they will draw, be drawn to. And so we spend way too much time as humans looking at our flaws and not enough time looking at our, our uh, strengths and and you know maybe it's a little narcissistic sometimes and I'll admit that but I think you know I think we just we need to see greatness in ourselves and then in turn inspire that in other people a hundred percent a hundred percent um I think that if people you know are watching this today and they don't feel at least a little bit inspired um watch it again just watch it again <laughs> and again let and those words again. soak up find your greatness <laughs> find your greatness um, you know, and certainly kind of like moving forward in the industry, um, you know, I, I think you kind of, you know, we, we're, we're both in that, that lane where, you know, yes, it, it sucks that everything's been upended and going through this, it, it's certainly like a shitty time of life, but, but I can't help but feel just like a little bit optimistic at the level of innovation that is going to come later, like that, because we will reopen, like it mm -hmm. will happen. We, we will get back to doing what we do, I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, but when we do, I feel like there's going to be a massive shakeup. And, uh, and and sometimes that's a really great thing. It leads to innovation. Some you know, some of it's not gonna be so great. Um, we'll kind of work through that, but I think some of it's gonna be really fantastic. Um, so is there, uh, you know, and someone you know pop popped up, who popped up with that? Uh, was it? Uh, Fausto. Sorry, Fausto. Your name doesn't pop up on Facebook, but find your greatness. Fausto is one of my favorite people in the whole world. So shout He's out shout out to the trifecta. <laughs> He's pretty fab. He is pretty fabulous. Um, and uh, and so certainly, you know, like when you're kind of like taking the long view of the industry, um, is, is there any part of it? And I know this is kind of like a deep dive and we're live. So, you know, you can tell me that you need time to think about it. Is there any part of it that you're just like looking forward to like dropping off? You'll be like, you know, I'm not going to be upset if I come back and this thing isn't a thing anymore. And it can be anything from, yeah. Um, well, there's trends that I don't love that I won't mind <laughs> if they die a slow death, um, like burlap. Um, yeah. Donut walls. <laughs> um, I actually like a donut wall. Confession. I don't like, um, you know what I don't like is, um, as I just saw Marcy Bloom talking about this, um, uh, mashed potatoes and, um, and. Oh, the, the mashed potatoes in the martini jar. Yeah, yes. I don't love that. Okay, but yeah. wait, I do have a legit answer. So I think that sometimes in this world we value quantity over quality. Um, and I kind of have seen events go that way, even weddings where like what is more important to them is their guest count. And so they need to have 300 people or they want a venue for 500 people or they just want it big and over the top. And I'm hoping that part of what happens here is that people start to understand the true value of intimacy and connection with people. Like what people are saying now is not they want to be with thousands of people. They just want to be with the people that they love. They want to be with their families and their best friends. And, and so I'm hoping, you know, I think some of us are afraid of what that looks like when we're when we are used to paychecks that are based on huge events. But I think that there is a way to do small, elegant, intimate events. And I think we need to reframe how we look at things and how we sell them um, to say what will impress people most is not necessarily the quantity of something, but the quality of something and and the intimacy of something and and the specialness of it. Um, and so that's, I, that's kind of a trend that I think I will definitely see kind of change. And I'm hoping that we kind of go in there and, and learn how to sell and talk those terms. Um, I also, I, I want, I want people to, um, make things more of an occasion just in general. Like, I think we started to get sloppy, sloppy at events, sloppy at traveling, so, you know, like, I think we should dress up to go out. I think that we, we should have more black tie dinners. I think 
we should, and I guess that goes back to like experience and quality over quantity. I think that things should be more of an occasion again. And I think we started to not, we, lo we lost the sense of occasion. And so I hope that comes back. That's what I got. Yeah. I'll think more. No, yeah, no, I, I think those are excellent points. And, you know, and certainly for, you know, I think that, you know, kind of going forward, it's just going to be really, I think you're right. I think that people are just going to reevaluate. I think there's been, it's been a great resetting point for a lot of our clients. Like, like, yes, I, I'm, you know, I've had to push my weddings and, and events back, you know, all the way back, just like everyone else has. But overwhelmingly, what I'm getting a lot from my clients is like, you know what, um, when, when, when I do come back, I'm going to do it differently. Right. You know, I've, le I've learned a lot of lessons and I feel they, they're they feeling like this is a redo where, you know, like I had one wedding client. It was going to be just like, just this beautiful, you know, wedding that was going to happen in the end of June. One of these portfolio type jobs um, for me personally. And that got pushed off. But, you know, the more and more that she and I were working together. Uh, you know, she wasn't she wasn't really happy with the way everything was turning out. And I knew it was because what you know, what her vision was for her event really wasn't matching what the market could provide um, in terms of venue, in terms of logistics, in terms of price tags and, and, and the whole um, uh -oh. uh, so, you know, so when we pushed it off and we were talking about what that's going to look like next spring, um, you know, we were talking about you know changing up the venue like making it more of what she actually wants instead right. of people are t dictating to her um, right and again yeah you know and, and are you finding um you know like as, as you're talking to like just people generally in the industry um that you're that you're you know are you hearing a lot of that from the venue vendor side where maybe you know maybe vendors you know because I'm, I'm that's what i'm kind of getting from some of the vendors as well we're like you know what you know we were slogging around we were taking on this kind of business um we were we were reactive in our business rather than proactive in our business um and and now it's time to maybe shift gears a little bit so you know i think that every i mean dear god drink for the word pivot like we have heard the word pivot so much but i actually think that that's a valuable concept and and not just in times of pandemic or coronavirus or whatever like we constantly have to reevaluate what we do as event professionals. And I think it's just really easy for us to go along with the trends and to do things because they're comfortable or because they're easy. And so I have heard a lot about people just reevaluating, like what are the products that they do and how do they do it and how much do they charge for it and why do they do it? Um, and I think it's a really important and valuable thing to do at this moment is just to step back and look at what you do and why you do it. And what do you do that you do because of what everybody else does? And what do you do because you're actually passionate about it? And not only that, are there things that you have always wanted to do that you haven't done because you're not sure that there's a market for it or you haven't had the time, like it's just easier to keep doing the same thing over and over again. This is such a great time to reevaluate and say, you know what, I'm gonna throw something out new and see if it sticks. Because I do think that coming out of this, there will be people in the events industry that drop off. And I do think that there will be people who come back. And so I think you need to, um, you just need to kind of find your niche again. And and it's not going to look exactly the same. I mean, even we even have to reevaluate things like our promo videos, like thinking of a DJ, for instance, like if all of your promo videos show a super packed dance floor and that's not what it's allowed to look like anymore, you have to rethink what you're doing and how you're selling yourself now to make yourself relevant for what's about to happen. Um, yeah, Irene, do you know Irene? Um, Irene, Irene Tinsdale, did I say that right? She's amazing. I know she's but she's doing some micro weddings that are really cool. There's there's people in our industry that are doing great things. Um, the Seldens have like started doing new things in New York. Like people are doing some amazing things in this industry, but I think it's a smart time to look because we're either going to change and adapt or we're going to be left behind. Well, and it's certainly the time where, you know, if people were kind of um, worried about how changing and adapting is going to re reflect their brand mm -hmm. um this is the this is the time to do it because i feel like you know if you're if your target customer is ever going to be 
tolerant of brand changes or brand shifts or brand or marketing shifts, this is the time that they're going to be tolerant about it. Maybe, I know. also feel in the events industry, like I have some great, um, I feel like I keep just throwing out names. So if you guys are listening to all this, look all these people up on Instagram, Facebook, but like um, Terika does amazing talks on brand all of the time. But one of the things um, that we talk about is, you know, your brand has to evolve also as you evolve, because people will say, this is my brand, but you know what, five years ago, your brand was maybe mason jars and burlap and pallets, but that can't keep being your brand. And so, you have to have this like umbrella theme of what you are, whether it's like luxury or it's comfort or it's classy or traditional or whatever that like that is your brand. Your brand is not this like one particular thing you do. Um, and so I do think people need more freedom to reevaluate what their brand is and make sure that their brand is something that can change as the industry changes. Like if your brand can't change as the industry changes, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. And I think that it, it brings up a really important point. Like, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I've kind of locally become known for is like the girl with the ideas, right? Like every year, every time you're talking to me, I might have something else that I'm looking to incorporate or to add. And, and it's really, it's because it's part of what I do as a business, right? I'm an event planner. So I'm constantly, you know, evaluating trends and seeing what sticks and seeing what people respond to um, and moving, moving forward. And personally, I find a lot of inspiration from the fashion industry. So again, kind of full, bringing that full circle, you know, I think that there's a lot of lessons, business lessons that we can learn from the fashion industry. You know, if, if anyone's out there who has been a longtime follower of Chanel uh, or the house of Chanel, um, and I'm sure that the, I'm sure that you are because I see it all over Instagram and every like everyone that's that's their go to. Then you're going to know that, you know, Karl Lagerfeld had, you know, what was at the helm of Chanel. And now I believe it's a woman named Vivienne. I could be wrong about that. But, you know, they've, they've switched sort of hands, um, and, you know, and they they're constantly involving. They're a luxury brand and they're they're iconic for being known as, um, you know, a particular aesthetic. But, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, you can't walk into a Chanel boutique and get the same merchandise season after season. They have right, exactly. Runs, as most luxury brands do. They have limited runs. Um, and so and that's an important lesson to be to, to bring over into the events industry where, you know, it's OK to have a limited run of something. Mm -hmm. It's OK. It's OK. Hey, to say, um, you know what, um, this is this is what I'm going to offer. I'm going to offer it for a limited season um, and to have that feel like, oh, yeah, you know what, you can. This is what I offer and I'm going to offer it for the next 10 years. Um, I don't personally find a lot of excitement in that. Not not as a business owner. I mean, that might be you. Um, and maybe you make a, a really good living out of it, but I, I feel that if you if you've ever been inclined to differentiate your product to get them those multiple stream, streams of income um, to expand, I'm gonna say across the board though, yeah, like it does. I mean, I'm gonna like say it strongly across the board, no matter what avenue you are in in the hospitality. If your brand, if your product has not changed in 10 years, then you are not relevant because flowers have changed, plates have changed, food has changed, um, like music has changed, the way we listen to music has changed, our AV has changed. And so if you are riding on the coattails of what you have always done, then you are going to be irrelevant. We have to constantly reinvent ourselves. Um, and that's scary. It's super scary. Um, but it's not just during pandemics. It's just every year you need to take stock and say, what are you doing? Because your competitors are going to leave you behind. Precisely. Precisely. Because every like, if you think about it, remember when yeah. photo strips were like brand new and it was super cool. I mean, I got married seven years ago and we had a photo strip at our wedding and it was super cool and everyone loved it. And now like um, my friend Chris does like the 360 boosts and all sorts like like if you're still like if you have an event that has a photo strip people are like how quaint they're not like whoa look at this t cutting edge technology you know yeah uh right exactly it you know everyone wants to be um everyone wants to do a little bit something different they always you know they they always want to be you know I, i've often said my clients want to be you know 
right outside, but pressed right up against the box. They exactly. <laughs> well, in the world of Instagram, Pinterest, social media, it's more, it's, it's more than it ever was. I mean, in 20 years ago, that's not what the world looked like because right. every cool idea came from an event that you actually went to. But now you just click, like you type in like cool weddings and 7,000 things come up. And so we have to constantly reevaluate ourselves because our clients are reevaluating. Yeah, I mean, it's an ever-evolving world. Like, fun fact, I uh, I was married, I divorced, but, um, you know, when I got married, you know, it really, you know, we were kind of just coming off of that age of, you know, shout out to all my Italian friends out there, um, because the Greeks, we do it too, of the multi-tiered wedding cakes with the stairwells. And yes. the figurines with the brides and the fountain in the center. So shout out if you've ever been to a wedding with a cake with a fountain in the center, because you know exactly what I am, uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, you know, and, and again, you know, it, I, what's funny about that is that I drive past the, the bake shop that did my wedding cake, and I see the same wedding cakes now that right. I saw way, way back, way, way, way back uh, when they were, you know, they, those were in fashion. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess they're doing business, but I don't, I don't know how, like, I don't know. If they wait a few more years, it might become fashionable again. <laughs> right. Someone's going to throw a, a retro party and then um, right. An Angela Mia will be, uh, and that was the bakery was Angela Mia. Um, so yeah, so, so, you know, everything old is new again, right? Maybe they're just riding the trend back full circle. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's all, you know, and again, it's, it's all just a matter of um, self exploration. I think that's, you know, that's what we're kind of getting to is, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, to explore, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, get out there, you know, you know, put two colors together that you never thought you'd put together. Um, it might be horrible. It might be horrific. You know what, then if, if you put it on, it's horrible, horrific, turn that into a, to a joke, you know, and let me be like, all right, so this is where my like self-exploration took me to today. And I have to say, every time you yeah. say self-exploration, I think of naughty things. So I'm trying oh. not to giggle. <laughs> like, like when That's my mom right. told me to lock myself in the bathroom and explore. <laughs> you, uh, you look, if, if that's what that means to you, then 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 do it I, you know again no, no judgment here um, i'm sorry we actually got uh, yeah, no we got we actually got a shout out from um taryn stubbs again taryn i'm sorry it's like when when you're doing um the comments on facebook facebook doesn't always it just says facebook user um mm -hmm. and she says that i'm from new york and i've been to many italian weddings and had the best time and yes they had that cake and i'm sure you saw the swan hey yes. shout, shout out to the did the swans that form the heart of course the two swans you, you weren't shit if you didn't have the swans that form the heart. Right. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. it, like it wasn't. Yeah. 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 Um, but again, like you're talking about, um, you know, people are doing dessert tables. They don't know that it used to be called a Venetian table um, in some circles. That's what that's what those dessert tables were called. Again, it all just hey, comes back in different. Just places. for the record, I'm not actually yes. drinking because somebody said what's in this drink. It's actually just spindrift. But later there may be tequila added. <laughs> I am a big advocate of drinking in fancy glasses because it makes you feel good. You know what? Yes. You're right. Like, don't, don't wait for company. You have fancy glasses. Use the damn fancy glasses. Exactly. Uh, you know, but certainly, you know, not, now that you're home and you're spending all this fabulous time, I mean, you know, we were talking before about, you know, that you're, you know, used to spend a lot of time away from family and friends. And now you're at home and you're spending a lot of time at home, just lots and lots of times at home. Um, are you someone that likes to cook at home? Like, is that, has that always been a thing? No. no. Uh, I, I am a, I, I do not. I have a first world lifestyle. <laughs> I enjoy um, eating out. I enjoy bars. I enjoy being served. Um, I do, you know, I have, I've been posting about that, that I've been doing a meal plan and that's kind of fun for my husband and I, and I surprisingly, I think what is surprising about it is because we're in quarantine and there's nothing to look forward to suddenly, like you're like, Oh, Wednesday's rib day. That sounds good. Or, you know, I'm a big fan of taco Tuesday. Um, so I, I like to cook desserts. I make a really good, um, German chocolate cake. But I would oh. say in general, I prefer if other people who are much better than me make things, put them on a tray and then feed me, that usually is better. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, I'm right there with you. Uh, you know what? And, and, like more to the point of it is that I like, A, I like the variety. I like being able to, you know, walk out and say, you know, oh, it's the end of the day. And, you know, what am I in the mood for? And I don't necessarily have to rely on what's in my fridge. Like I can- Or do the dishes. Okay. Or, right. Or clean up or do anything. It's also the experience of it, of being out and enjoying the atmosphere. Um, you know, and you're out there and you're just like, you know, enjoying great company and enjoying, you know, the good time. Um, right. or, or the, if it's a lousy meal, the bad time too, because there's, you know, I never, I never thought that I'd ever, you know, be whimsical or, you know, nostalgic about lousy meals again. <laughs> right. I, I would take one of those right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even so, so, I mean, so, you know, you're, you definitely a huge lover of Detroit. Um, and we're, we're right now, we're right at about the, the 55 minute mark. Um, and I want to be respectful of your time. I want to be respectful of everyone else's time out there as well. Because I know, like, we could start on rabbit holes and we could just keep going all afternoon. It's true. It's true. Um, but I wanted to wrap it up by, you know, by my one, you know, follow-up question that I do at the end of all the interviews is everything opens up and you can go wherever you want to go and eat whatever you want to eat. Where are you going and what are you eating? Mm, uh, first, I'm going to Inyo and I'm eating sushi. Um they were doing carry out for a while and then they closed and I was super sad. Um, and then I'm going to the Oakland Art Novelty Company. Um, they don't have food, but they have amazing cocktails and my favorite summer, I just saw Fasto the pop again. comment. Yeah. Yeah, so that's Fasto Fasto said that I make him feed me grapes at Cater Source, which is not entirely false. I love you, Fosto. Um, and then, uh, so they make a great summer drink and it's called the rhubarb Walters and it's, um, amazing. It's rhubarb and vodka. And, um, that I don't know. Like Barbara Walters. <laughs> so we live, we live just outside of downtown Detroit, um, in Ferndale. And it's like, like right behind our house is like, we live on the, behind the street that has like all local restaurants. So I probably will just like eat my way down the street. We'll go to Pops. We'll, and then you can just roll me back. If you're ever in Detroit, I have a million uh, restaurants that you should try. We're foodies. It's good. And and as we've offered, you know, you'll meet up for drinks. No problem. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I'll um, buy one. You buy two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Buy one, get two. <laughs> oh, and I'm going to Anti Hero. They're really amazing too. They also do Asian food. Oh, fantastic! And they do a uh, and they do a drink that's with um, mezcal, so it's like smoky and wonderful, and it's in a, like one of those little kitties, you know, like a little. That's oh, the the, the um, happy cat. Yeah, it's like, like the Chinese happy cats. Yeah, it's in a little happy cat with a straw. <laughs> I have I have little happy cat figurines. I need to know. I I didn't realize I could get a cup. I yeah, it's I, you can at NJ Hero. Fantastic. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for being a guest on today. I hope that, you know, people, you know, have really had their eyes opened as to the various paths that they could take, um, in, you know, within the events industry. Um, and certainly, if you ever get a chance to watch Jamie live, 100% make the effort to do it. Um, because, you know, you're definitely you're on multiple seminars, you're out there, you know, in multiple um, venues throughout the year. And uh, if you're ever in Detroit, you know, go ahead and look her up. You know? And my just whoever you are, wherever you are, just be you and know that that's enough. That's my that's my ending feel good moment. Just know that who you are is exactly enough. Even if you're eating this in your sweatpants, watching this in your sweatpants, eating Doritos, you're it's enough. It's all good. It is all good. All right, Jamie. Well, thank you so, so much. And I hope thank that you. you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. You too. I'm going to go sit in front of a fan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, me too. Go, Bye. Bye. Bye.